It was 4,000 years ago, the two superpowers bent their iron-shod wills towards each other's utter destruction, and in the process, brought the world to the brink of ruin. The Azur and the Dawi, who had every reason to band together to end the threat of chaos for good, slaughtered each other from the gates of Lothurn to the hallowed halls of Karazhar Karak. The brutal conflict would come to be known as the War of Vengeance, and the hatred it woke between the High Elves and the Dwarfs would mark their relationship all the way to modern day. We're back in the Old World, and the Elgi have come a long way to reclaim their phoenix crown. Prince Tyrion, heir of Anarion, wants it back, and he'll meet Thorak Ironbrow in the underway in the first steps of his invasion. Amazing duelist, but hyper expensive at more than 2,000 gold, he left Melhendir at home to keep a low profile and hopefully not get shot to pieces. Sunfang, Faint and Repost, and Heart of Avalorn are his items, and he's leading an army of elite knife ears here, including the Swordmasters of Hoath, who get up to 62 melee attack base against enemy infantry. Incredible stats, but very susceptible to artillery fire and runes, but pretty much tailor-made for killing Dawi with those gigantic Zweihanders. 14 bonus versus infantry with that much AP is no joke. We'll be joined by a host of white lions, including the Pure Main Company Regiment of Renown, a bunch of spears and archers, and the Grey Shadow Warriors, stalking and sniping ambushers with fantastic melee stats. They are also very expensive, but they have the added benefit of being able to shoot without ever being seen. So if you keep them at their max range of 180, they can put in a ton of work. Two war lions on the flanks will provide some flanking potential, AP and bonus versus infantry, although Italian Spartacus is still mad they look like they're on crack after a weekend bender, and not the majestic specimens of lore. Can't say he's entirely wrong on that front. And finally, a light mage with Fa's protection and Barona's time warp to help the infantry buzzsaw their way through the front ranks. Should be getting that guardian aura from the most elite of the White Lion companies, whose armor sundering will be invaluable here as well. The dwarfs will strike first blood, as they tend to do in this rivalry. Goblobber is the ultimate form of disrespect. Getting your skull caved in by some stupid groby chained to a grudge mark is none too pleasing, and the approach for the high elves in this one will be none too simple. Not only do they have to contend with a brutal fire arc from the stone throwers and thunderers, but runes will slow them down, gyros will drop bombs, and a very aggressive minor contingent out front can explode their infantry with blasting charges, further stuffing up the advance. That is five minor units, including Ekron's miners, pushed very far forward, and they're a big reason why melee rushes against the Dawi can be kind of difficult to pull off, especially if you don't have tons of chariot support. Gyro bombers are very effective at sniping out single entities and suppressing targets, slowing their speed by 35%, and of course have great wave clear with their Moabs. But they do have to be careful of the Grey in this one, who can fire from shadow and quickly snipe them from the sky. They only have 3,000 HP, and that armor only goes so far. Thoric Ironbrow is leading the army. His Rune of Doom is a big problem, causes fear. Most High Elves don't have immune to psychology, and he's brought Rune of Wrath and Ruin, Rune of Speed, and Rune of Slowness to slow down some of that Azur aggression. Unquestionably, the best Dwarf Lord by far. It's not even close. In the rear is that Goblobber, dropping boulders from downtown, and a Master Engineer with Flash Bomb for even more slows. So, those are the builds. Now, High Elves are absolutely favored in this matchup, and one of the ways they can make life miserable for miners is by bringing a ton of archers and shooting them to pieces. Like, six to eight archers will obliterate a miners with blessing charge strat, and has the added benefit of making it dangerous for gyros too, which are also pretty common in this matchup. Dwarves can counter archer spam with organ guns, elves can counter organ guns with magic missiles, bolt throwers, or alphanar, Rune Lords can counter the counter sniping, and so it goes. But most of that will not transpire here, because it's an elite High Elves army, so the Spears will play it like they're Ratmen, like they're Skaven, like they're Vermin, like they're expendable, because they are. And guess what? They're gonna die, and die extremely quickly as they charge in. Didn't even touch melee combat before losing all of their HP, and already one Azur Spear is off the field, while White Lions are taking the brunt of a bunch more blasting charges. Now, there are ways for the elves to bait out some of these explosives. You don't want to just send all your elite infantry right up the gut, because you're exposing them to more thunder or fire, to the grudge throwers, to all of this arcing explosive fire that's already cost many Azur lives. Tyrion, by himself, 
can charge in and force some of these blessing charges, but miners are pushing past him like he's not even there, and it's probably the right call. They only cost 350 gold. If they get one good volley into archers or into the back of, say, the pure main company, they've pretty much already paid for themselves. And it's not just in terms of the damage value, it's about the fact that they're making it very difficult for the Azur to advance at all, because they don't want to go into the fire arc and take a full blasting charge volley to the face. Now, this gyro bomber has already lost half of its health, and that is because of the gray, which is sniping from the flank and does a lot of damage to single entities because the calibration area on their volleys is very small. They're very accurate. So big time pick there while the white lions charge in from behind and look to tie down all these thunders. Now, there are only two white lions and there are a bunch of thunders. In fact, it looks like there are four of them supported by that master engineer. So this might be a bit of a suicide run, but the opening engagement and rush from the high elves has been so poor and they've taken so much damage on the way in that this is maybe the only way for the Azur to start opening things up and make sure that they don't take another rank of volley fire on their charge in. So these white lions will probably die or at least take a lot of damage. They do have missile resist, but it won't be enough against two or three thunders firing in from their flanks, but they can cause some damage before they go down and more importantly, open things up for the advance and at least momentarily silence those guns. It has been a disorganized assault thus far on the High Elf side, no question about it, mostly due to a brilliant formation and layered zones of Daka. Illyrian Reavers made their play in the rear, but half the unit stuck on the wrong side, which means they're food for great weapons in melee, as the lucky ones make their way towards the Thunderers to support the remnants of those War Lions who have pretty much already routed off. But the Azur are beginning to make headway on the Dwarf's right flank, and the Gyro Bomber is continuing to drop. Now, the Rune of Slowness comboed with more Blasting Charge Volleys and the Thunderers. It's just been brutal for the Azur on the approach. This has been nasty for them, 100%. They have lost probably half of their infantry already, and things look super bleak. But once they touch melee combat, remember, Dwarves have invested 70% of their army into ranged troops. Once the Pyramid Company and the Swordmasters make it into melee if they're able to do so, they should be able to turn things back quite quickly, especially because they'll be supported by Barona's Time Warp and Fa's Protection. And Time Warp giving melee attack and speed exactly what the High Elves want. They just haven't cast anything yet because they haven't gotten close enough to use any spells. The Dwarf's formation is pretty disorganized at this point as well, although they're getting great value destroying that pure main company. Tyrion leading the charge into Akron's Miners and it looks like the White Lions will make it into melee, but the question is, how much HP will they have remaining by the time they charge in with those big Bardishes? Sunfang, not quite the right fire arc on that one, but dealt a little bit of damage to the Thunderers. And more focus fire from these guns, able to snipe out Foot Tyrion too. He's losing some HP down to about two-thirds health. Balance bar shifting a little bit in favor of the Dawi. And Rune of Doom popped while the Gyro Bomber Looks like it will go down to the gray sniping from the flank, and I don't think it's gotten too many bomb drops off, maybe one or two on the white lions. But Tyrion has that burst heal from the heart of Avalorn, so even if he drops very low, he should be okay, and Swordmasters are relatively healthy after killing off a full minor unit. So things are beginning to crumble down now for the Dawi formation, and once their back line is inundated, the martial prowess of the High Elves will kick in, and it should be quite a few stunties sliced down even smaller. The Grey Shadow Warriors are really the only thing that have kept the Azur in the game up to this point. Without them, without that Gyro Bomber being sent off the field, and some of the Thunderers being sniped out from their unshielded side, this would probably just be a mass route for the High Elves and a pretty easy win for the Dwarfs, but they bought enough time for the standard foot archers to close into range and the white lions to get into melee that things might start shifting back into a more even and contested position but they still got some infantry to get through before they can make their way over to the gob lobber dwarf warriors with great weapons have zero hope of beating sword masters in melee there's a gigantic gulf in quality between those two units but 
They don't need to do much except just hold on for a teeny bit, give those Thunderers and Artillery a little bit more time to fire. But Barona's Time Warp and Fa's Protection are both important spells here. We haven't seen them used much yet, but the 25% speed boost from Barona's Time Warp will allow the Swordmasters and White Lions to crest that hill and start moving towards the Grudge Thrower in the back of the map. And some good focus fire from the Azure Archers is also reaping a terrible toll in and amongst the Dawi lines. Now that is a Rune of Wrath and Ruin. White Lions a little bit blobbed up around those Akron's Miners and though their armor will protect them somewhat, just saw a whole host of Elite Warriors go flying and that Rune of Wrath and Ruin is super good. Now Heart of Avalorn did pop for Tyrion and he was still bursted down by the Gyro Bomber almost immediately after it. So he went up back to half HP and then immediately down to one-fourth or one-fifth. So Tyrion has not done much, and he's 2,000 gold, so that's a problem. Let's see if he manages to survive the Onslaught. Barona's Time Warp activated on the Pure Main Company and the Swordmasters, and that will give them more than enough speed to close in with those Thunderers and cut them down to size, while the Grey, which have been the MVP for the High Elves up to this point, are using their 47 melee attack and, what, like 42 melee defense? Super good stats to harry and harass these routing Dawi and using all those skills sharpened from decades of border wars with the dark elves the only dwarf unit that can beat them in melee on this battlefield is thorak ironbrow himself atop his anvil of doom goblobber crew disemboweled by sharpened great axes barona's time warp finally generating some big time value for the azur and Tyrion may not survive that's the second time he's routed the master engineer is just at the edge of his fire arc and one more shot would be enough to kill him but Tyrion manages to get out of range just in time it's not gonna matter he can't get any more healing he will probably never taste melee combat again this battle and he really did not do much except kill a handful of miners so Alphanar usually the meta pick for the high elves in this matchup trying something different in this one it looks like and yeah the uh Tyrion just didn't seem to, to generate any value whatsoever. Maybe on Malhandir, he'd be a little bit better, but then you're just exposing yourself to even more Thunderer and Trollhammer Torpedo Fire. But yeah, he's taking a dirt nap. Uh, it'll be a wet one. And yeah, that was, that was pretty gross. Not a great performance from him, but maybe not an easy battle for him to uh, make the impact you typically like to. Uh, honestly, Alarial is probably more the meta pick than Alphanar. Alarial is just kind of busted in general, and if you bring two Noble Chariots, you're pretty much always going to bring Alarial the Everqueen, but Alphanar can be quite useful in this matchup as well, and if you're sniping out someone like Thorak Ironbrow, that would certainly be beneficial. There's not a whole lot of Dawi left. Handful of Dwarf Warriors with great weapons being hunted by War Lions out here on the Serengeti Plains being savaged by a pride. Yeah, they're not having a good time. <laughs> I think they're probably going to run. Yeah, remember that, that 10 bonus versus infantry will generate more melee attacks. So they'll go from 30 melee attack to 40, and they'll get 10 extra weapon strength and go from 50 to 60. They're not quite as good as Flesh Hounds of Corn, but they have some uses. They're a little bit too expensive. I hope they get reworked a little bit in game three. Now, another bonus time warp, forcing that Gyro Bomber off, and Thoric Ironbrow has a lot of work to do. Balthor is still in favor of the Dawi, and that Anvil of Doom has a chance to make a huge impact here, because he's good in melee. I mean, he's not easy to kill at all. Fully surrounded by AP units, and he'll take some damage here, but in these long battles, he really generates insane value, because all his runes are simply cooldown. 120 second cooldown. That's it. He can keep casting over and over and over again, Especially with that Rune of Doom, there's no cap to that. So he can keep causing fear. And in a late game scenario where White Lions and Swordmasters don't have any immune psychology, that fear could be pretty impactful, as are his runes of Wrath and Ruin. My god! Just shish kebabbing a whole section of the High Elves army, and they're probably going to learn after that one. Maybe we don't want to blob up around him. And you'd think, like, hey, we got a bunch of AP units. We can just tear him down. He's so close to routing. But no. They no longer have this round. They just got sent flying. And most of the High Elf army is running now. And the archers are running out of ammunition. Rune of Doom activated for the second time this battle. And that is where that fear is a huge 
problem. Because the Grey are going to rout. The Swordmasters are going to rout. They will return. But leadership is a problem for the Azur as we move closer to the end of this battle. Though, if you look at the length of this video, you'll probably notice we got a while yet to go. Both armies are in tatters. Not surprising how it went up to this point, I don't think. Elite infantry army, a lot of it exploded on the way in against such a ranged focus build. And then once they made it in, they were able to claw it back with just better martial prowess and sustained melee combat. But the Gyro Bomber, Master Engineer, and Thoric Iron Brow are good enough together. And now they're into the archers, who might as well fight it out. They have no ammo left. Do what they can. Tie him down. They won't do a lot of damage, but the mage might. She's got 275 weapon strength and okay melee attack. So especially if she activates another Brona's Time Warp, she might be able to land some shanks into Thoric Iron Brow's butthole. And the Grey managed to close in with their Loic Shroud. That's more speed, stock, and unspottable. So they can get out about like two or three feet in front of your face before they're revealed and before you can see them. And they use that to great effect here to finish off the rest of those Thunders. And yes, a Baronis Time Warp in the background, giving that mage and the rest of her archers a bit more melee potential. See if they'll be able to drag down anything. It looks like the Master Engineer is about to rout the mage, beating him up in melee combat. But the Gyro Bomber has zero melee defense, essentially. I mean, you don't get hit by everything, but it has decent melee attack and weapon strength. So it's... I wouldn't call it a force in melee, but it can be useful in these kind of scenarios. There's a lot going on here. We've got Thorek, who's being dragged down. He wants to run while Barona's Time Warp is active, but might not be able to outpace the mage when she's got a 25% speed boost. Marching his way over, trundling his way into the archers. There's still Swordmasters, still White Lions, and still some elite melee troops for the High Elves, but just not a whole lot left. I mean... As I said, these armies are in tatters, and pretty much all the Dawi reinforcements are gone, which will leave the Gyro Bomber and Thorak by himself. But once again, the Rune of Doom for that map-wide fear activating, and a lot of High Elf troops deciding they want no further part. Really, it's another reason why Ilarial is a much better option than Tyrion in the High Elves vs. Dwarfs matchup. She grants a 45 meter radius of immunopsychology around her. That's pretty important against the Rune of Doom. So yeah, Swordmasters and White Lions. White Lions cause fear, so the fear won't affect them. But I think the Swordmasters, oh God, another Rune of Wrath Ruin. This one was not quite as good as the first two, but still more than enough to clear out all the chaff surrounding him. And now the Grey are left by themselves, but Thorak is dropping super low. And a lot of that is due to the Swordmasters who had Barona's Time Warp active on them for a while. They're terrifying with all that extra speed and attack. Master Engineer being hounded to the edge of the map by that Light Mage and the remnants of the White Lions. Now the Gyro Bomber trying to give it space to allow the Engineer to return to the fold. And the Hios need this pick. They need that Engineer gone because he's pretty noticeable in terms of the balance of power. If he's around, especially with all that ammunition left, he'd be able to snipe out the Mage by himself. So they need to stay close to him as they run to the edge and make sure he disappears. Because that balance bar will probably go back to even if he is successfully shooed off of Mushroom Cave. And it looks like he's gone. Yeah, and you can pretty much immediately see the impact on that balance of power. Still in favor of the Dawi, but not by much. And frankly, I think balance of power at this point will be pretty much irrelevant. It's handful of the Grey. Handful of White Lions, and then Slivers of HP on the Gyro Bomber and on Thorak Iron Brow. But all this time away from combat, giving Thorak more opportunity to recharge that Rune of Doom and recharge his Rune of Wrath and Ruin. And into mail he goes atop his anvil. And I don't know if. Yeah, the Grey have less HP than Thorak himself. They're great in melee, but they're not going to be able to shank him down. In fact, I don't know that they're going to do a whole lot of damage at all. They don't have a lot of AP, and he has 120 armor. He's only taken 50 damage since this engagement began. There it is. You can't dodge it. It comes out way faster than most other bombardment spells. It also does less damage than plenty of other spells, but more than enough against the low armor of the Grey, and they're gone. They're shattered. 
Thorak has been a freak of nature. And we're 15 minutes in. And now we've got a 2v2 scenario. White Lions. And a mage. Against a Gyro Bomber. And Thorak Ironbrow. And the Gyro's going right in. Because he wants to activate that Rune of Doom for plus 24 melee attack and more fear. Which might get the mage and the White Lions running. But they're holding their ground. Landing a lot of attacks. And almost immediately the Gyro Bomber runs. 350 HP left. It has 130 kills and it's earned some chevrons too. But we might not see that Gyro Bomber again, which will leave Thorek to fight the remnants of this High Elf army all by himself. Can he do it? Can he hold the line against this AP charge downhill? The War of the Beard 2.0 hangs in the balance. Can the Anvil of Doom put the nail in the coffin? For the High Elves. He's charging in. 1100 HP on Thorek. 700 HP on the Mage. He's up to 161 kills. There's Wavering. 900 HP now. Oh my god, he's getting insane. How does he have another rune? How does he have another one? He just used that. That's insane. White Lions look like they're about to break, but they're holding. They're still... How are they holding? The leadership... For the High Elves holding at the most important stage of the battle. Thorak just got shanked in the rear. 650 HP now. White Lions reforming for another charge to get their charge bonus off and get the full strike out. But they just broke. And the mage is going to break and Thorak's wavering. But he broke. Oh my god. The Dwarf just won. <laughs> what an insane battle. It does not get closer than that. Thorak on slivers of health left. Wavering. Mage wavering, and the mage broke maybe a handful of seconds before Thorak did. And he is the last Dawi standing, and it does not get more Pyrrhic or Valiant for either side. Now, Romulan Dog played that dwarf build super well. Range focus army, super hard to bust down with the build that I decided to bring. I went elite on the infantry, did not bring noble chariots, didn't want to go like hyper meta there, but... Kind of wanted to focus on the infantry. Tyrion was the big mistake here. And I wish I just hadn't brought him. <laughs> he was not good here at all. Maybe on Malhandir he would have been a little bit more impactful. Because he could have at least closed into CQB with the Thunderers a lot easier. And tied them down. But honestly just Alathanar in the back. Sniping out enemy characters. Sniping out the Gyro Bombers from the sky. Just guaranteed value on that front and Tyrion did essentially nothing for me now the gray did 2000 damage value on them war lions weren't used incredibly well but honestly i think they needed to be used in a sacrificial capacity at that stage of the battle with how bad the assault was going trying to get cute and fancy dodging all the miners with blasting charges and it didn't work great but you also can't really afford to ignore them because then you've got miners that are moving into your back line to throw at your archers and you could kite them across the map, but I think that would ultimately be a net loss for the High Elves on that front. So clearing out all the miners initially was the right call. I just think that it needed to be a little bit more of a cohesive attack, and the timing was just thrown off by some really good play and slows from the Gyro Bombers, from the Rune of Slowness, and from that Flash Bomb. So really nicely put together build from the Dwarfs. But yeah, the, the Grey were amazing and kept me in that game for as long as I was in it. White Lions and Swordmasters all did okay. But yeah, really fun battle and a great rivalry. War of the Beard 2.0. This round goes to the Dawi. GG to Romulan Dog. And I'll see you all in the next video. Indie Pride signing out for now. Have a good one, guys.